Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. The COP17 climate change negotiation conference that was in Durban is now over. Canada, just a few days ago, announced it's actually pulling out of the Kyoto Agreement, and Russia then came out and backed Canada's move. So where now goes the pu public policy, international policy, dealing with climate change? Now joining us to talk about all this is Patrick Bond. Patrick is the director of the Center for Civil Society in South Africa. He's also a professor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, but right now he's traveling in China, and he joins us from Chongqing. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Good to be with you, Paul. So, first of all, what, did, what in your mind came out of Durban? Well, a zombie emerged, really. Uh, you know, the heart and the soul of pain, if you will, of, of the Kyoto Protocol, which was to get binding agreements and deep cuts. Uh, in the second round, uh, those objectives were not achieved and uh, the sort of nominal commitment to be negotiated over the next period that there will be a, a round that will go through 2018. But, you know, Paul, the, the crucial thing for the Europeans who put this deal together at that last minute um, is to keep carbon markets going. It's the piece of the Kyoto Protocol that Al Gore, the, the Vice President in 1997, he uh, insisted to be part of a deal to allow northern polluters to continue. And then he said, well, the U.S. will sign. Of course, the U.S. didn't sign. They voted 95 nothing in the Senate against the protocol. And now Canada following Russia, Japan, uh, dropping out. And that probably kills uh, pretty much everything that you'd want from a Kyoto Protocol, a fully binding agreement that will really get the deep cuts that the world desperately needs. And so that part is dead, and yet what is stumbling along, tripping and maybe crashing uh, even this week, would be the carbon market piece, which is $140 billion a year, mainly in the European markets, nothing to sneeze at. A little market here in Quebec, a new one might start in California, maybe Australia in a couple of years, possibly China, but, you know, these are small... Well, the, a, a, new, a new market's just been opened, announced in, in Quebec, Canada, Quebec, in spite of the Canadian government pulling out of Kyoto, which the government of Quebec denounced, they announced their own uh, cap-and-trade program in Quebec. It's a, it's a bit of a distraction. It's good to see uh, Quebec as ever fighting the insanity of the, the conservatives in, in Ottawa. But on the other hand, this uh, for at least uh, the, the, the 14 years since we've had the Kyoto Protocol has proved a terrible distraction of a privatization of the air that's so filled with fraud, corruption, and then instability, volatility. You know, carbon is like a commodity, and we've seen how they've been up and down. And then this week, the carbon markets themselves showed how much they thought of the whole Durban platform, all of the work over the two weeks in Durban by crashing. Now, uh, Union Bank of Switzerland is saying down to three euros a ton. Don't forget, Paul, the peak was around 33 five years ago. And then going into the Durban meeting around eight, um, and so the anticipation, in fact, the futures market today is around four and a half years of time. This is, this is calamitous if you believe that the markets can solve a market problem. And so what, why, why have the prices dropped so much? Well, partly, well, it's the oversupply. I mean, of course, the context is crucial. The world elites have shown for the seventh time they aren't serious about cutting emissions. And if you cut emissions and get that cap on to get the trading that goes on underneath the cap, uh, it won't work. And the most important thing is ideas on the supply side, in other words, to try to get the carbon markets to um, uh, so expansive that even forests or soil carbon in Africa can be funded uh, through carbon markets has been the agenda. But when you start adding all of the supply that that implies, then you over uh, supply, you glut an already glutted market. And that's what people are fearing, that, that things like red reducing emissions deforestation and forest degradation would have that effect. But Paul, a crucial point here is that the people designing the Green Climate Fund, especially Trevor Emmanuel, the co-chair of uh, the design team, the South African minister, a crucial figure in, in, in the politics of climate governance, uh, they anticipated half of that Green Climate Fund, which Hillary Clinton in 2009 said should be $100 billion a year, would come from the carbon markets. But now it appears that's just a fantasy. There's no chance at all of the biggest fund uh, in history, five times as large as what the World Bank lends each year, could actually be 
properly. And that means, well, maybe you have to go back to the public accounts. And of course, with countries like the U.S. and, and Canada and many Europeans in, in this austerity uh, fetish, uh, there's just money there. So the whole framing of global climate governance, the promise made in Copenhagen, the sort of bribery, if you will, of a green climate and aid it's all falling apart. And that means we really have to look at the national and the local activists to pick up the slack where the sort of 1% eats in conventions and are completely failless. So the, the point here is that the market mechanisms that were supposed to be the answer, the market mechanisms are, are falling apart and failing. So you've got, uh, just for people that are not on top of this story, explain a bit about wh how carbon markets are supposed to reduce carbon emissions. Well, you see, instead of just imposing a cut, uh, as a government should, and we, we do have a great precedent for that in chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs, that created uh, an expanding ozone. And in Montreal in 1980, they, they kept it and then they phased out the CFCs. Now, because of the vested interest in Kyoto, and especially uh, the U.S. saying, no, no, we don't want to do uh, a, a rules-based regulatory system of phasing out greenhouse gases, we'll... we'll try and reduce the total, but within that, we're going to trade and let big companies buy the right. And that means privatize or let somebody uh, in the north buy somebody in the south's right to pollute is one of the kind of classic cases, or let more efficient companies buy the right from less efficient. And that way, the market logically find the most um, uh, painless way to adjust to the, the need to get rid of greenhouse gases so the planet won't, won't be... And the idea is the market solution works when you have a market problem. You solve this externality by internalizing it. Those are the phrases the economists came up with. Well, we believe them, or many did anyway, the environmentalists who bought into the European Union. The U.S. never played ball. Canadians were ambiguous. And now um, it looks like the markets, just like we expect the bankers of responsibility like the financial system, they blow that. And would you give them the next responsibility, saving the plant? This is now uh, beyond absurd. So, so a coal-firing uh, plant that creates electricity, now, because the price of these carbon credits is so low, it doesn't really mitigate their carbon emission at all. They can pick up some cheap credits and carry on doing what they're doing. But the second piece of this, you were saying, is this Green Climate Fund that came out of Durban, which is supposed to be one of its achievements, doesn't actually have any way really to be funded now. It appears so. It's just an empty bank account. You know, we really need these, these carbon markets to be hitting 50, 60 euros a ton. At that level, you could expect some incentive, make some switches away from fossil fuel energy, away from private transport, and you'd get your public transport, your renewable energy, your new production systems, your new disposal systems. All of these could conceivably work if the price was much higher, but you can tell there's just no will to do that. The will of the politicians, the 1%, the delegates, the negotiators, was to basically serve the interests of their own business elites and, and uh, fossil fuel industries amongst those. So well, we in the United States, much of the, of the environmental movement, green movement, is still demanding some kind of carbon trade system. So if that really isn't effective, at least not, not as we've seen it, uh, what should people be demanding? Well, I think drop the mainstream and big environmental movements. The delusion of the big environmental groups, uh, I mean, you could argue that it's just an intellectual problem they have understanding the markets don't work. They shouldn't have that problem anymore, not after 2008. Also a money problem that they were getting, the estimates are around 300 million in 2009, 2010, especially from Washington to push cap and trade. You really have to forget that absolute distraction of the carbon markets and go to work at the grassroots. I see in the Niger Delta, the, the environmental rights action, keep the oil in the soil, or the Yasuni Park, where Axion Ekoloki and Konai in Ecuador have been making very strong proposals and doing activism. In North America as well, I mean, the Canadians and the Tar Sands stopping Barack Obama, 1,250 arrests in Washington, 200 in Ottawa. Um, protests in Virginia to stop and top removal, some early successes there. Sierra Club and community getting 150 coal-fired power plants turned off before they're even started uh, using litigation and community protests. And those are the kinds of activities. There's a great group, Grassroots Global Justice, uh, motivating activists all over to keep the oil in the soil, leave the coal in the hole. That's the first defense strategy. Other activists are working on uh, new transition strategies to a transition. We had a 
wonderful set of meetings with labor. They're very slow to come on board climate justice, but now they're saying, well, a million climate jobs in places like Britain, South Africa, those campaigns are up and running and uh, hoping in North America as well. Some of the better trade unionists are going to, to join in and make this a genuinely uh, labor community and environmental coalition because as it's patently obvious, Paul, you just cannot trust the politicians now. Okay, thanks very much for joining us, Patrick. Good to be with you. I'll see you again. And thank you for joining okay. us on The Real News Network. And don't forget, we're in the midst of our uh, 2011 $200,000 challenge fundraising campaign. So if you click this donate button over here now, every dollar you donate will be matched. Thanks again for joining us on The Real News Network.